I want to begin this morning by thinking about the, um, the story of the Bible. There is a, a word that goes around the theological circles called the meta-narrative. Not sure you've ever heard of that before. How many of you heard meta-narrative before? What's the meta-narrative? There are four words where they go with meta-narrative. They are creation, fall, redemption, and consummation and restoration. Restoration is the word that that I have here. It's often called the meta narrative, the, the overarching story of the Bible. There's the creation and then the fall and the redemption and then the restoration. It's how many people have just described the whole story. Right? The Bible begins with the creation of God. God speaking the world into existence, teeming with life and beauty, the, the crowning achievement being, of course, the creation of Adam and Eve made in his own image. He put them in the Garden of Eden to, to tend it and uh, Gave them the task of multiplying and having dominion over the earth. The one thing they couldn't do was eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. And they failed their task. Rather than obeying the Lord, they disobeyed the Lord and they ate of the tree. And so you've got the creation and then you have the fall. That first generation, you have the fall of mankind. It's the, it's the thing that explains the mess that this world is, is in. The fall of mankind brought sin and suffering and death into this world. It, it brought rebellion against the Lord into this world. It brought conflict with each other into the world. In fact, all of the brokenness of life can be traced back to Adam and Eve and the fall of mankind. And you see the consequences of the fall throughout the Bible. I mean, story after story in the Bible shows that the Bible is not a story of righteous people doing righteous things to bring themselves to God. Rather, it's a story of broken people whom God uses to bring about his ultimate plan of redemption. So there's the creation and the fall, and you see that, but you also see then the budding story of redemption. Old Testament promising of Messiah and anticipating and showing in the sin we need as Messiah. And then eventually through this brokenness, God's woven in the page of Scripture the narrative of redemption, in which God responds to our rebellion in his grace and sending his son to live a, a perfect life and die on the cross for our sins. And, and he raised from the dead that we might experience forgiveness ourselves and reconciliation with God and reconciliation with others and we might walk in newness of life. And the hope of this resurrection is really offered for all who would believe and trust in Jesus. But the redemption was really only a foretaste of this ultimate restoration. The restoration is when everything's all back brought back together. Because even in the redemption, it, it's still not all quite right. There are some things, right? We're, we're right with God, but there's still not things right with the world. But the restoration is when all of humanity is, in which humanity is restored spiritually with God. The wicked have been judged. God brings those who trust in Christ to himself, and it's restored physically. It's a, in, a, in a renewed new creation to walk no longer Right, Just by faith in a sin-tainted world, but to walk in righteousness with God where once Adam and Eve did in the garden. It's really the story of the Bible, the, the creation and the fall, redemption, and restoration. Now, when you look at that, you think about, okay, so creation covers the first two chapters of the Bible. And then the fall happens in, in chapter 3. And you've got tons of books and tons of Old Testament in the fall and even in the redemption, you got lots of books, lots of stories talking about that. But then the restoration comes in the very last two chapters of the Bible. And we've come this morning then to that last two chapters of the Bible, which are the last two chapters of Revelation, where we see the restoration of all things. So you can open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, where we're going to see just the, the restoration of, of all things. The title of my message this morning is entitled the the new creation, from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8, because that's what we're going to see. We're going we're to see the restoration, and we're going to see new creation coming, and we're going to see the, the restoration in chapters 21 and 22, when we see God dwelling among men, the perfect environment, and in a, in a perfect life. Now, before I read these verses, I want you to catch the context. We've been in the book of Revelation like 10 months, maybe. Something like that. Almost a year. We've just gone through every word. We've read every phrase here in this, this book. Tried to interpret it as best we could. But you think about Revelation began with the glory of Christ. That picture in Revelation chapter 1. And then his, his letters to the churches in 3 and 4. And then that picture of, of Christ being worshipped in heaven. To God and to the Lamb. 
who sits on the throne be glory and honor. So we see the, the glory of Jesus at first, and, and then beginning in chapter 6, we see the seal judgments being poured out. And then we see the trumpet judgments being poured out in chapters 8 and 9. And, and then we see even the bowl judgments in chapter 16. And it's just a, a lot of judgment between chapters 6 through 16. And then chapters 17 to 20, we see the return of Jesus and his final victory over his enemies. And now 21 cha chapter 21 begins with all of creation judged and God bringing in his new creation. So with that as a, a backdrop. I want to begin reading here. And this is the good news, finally, after so much judgment, right? Thanks for hanging <laughs> along together with us, right? It's been all this judgment, all this sorrow, all this difficulty, and now comes the light. We see what we're looking for, finally. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And from these verses, I want to just make three simple observations about the, the nature of this new creation. Uh, first of all, we have this, that all things will be new. And, and by the way, most of my observations come from verses 1 through 4, but they're paralleled in verses 5 through 8. So primarily I'm going to talk 1 through 4, but I'm going to pull in verses 5 through 8 as each point comes across. And you see that just right here. My point is that, that all things will be new. Verse 1 speaks about a, a new heaven. talks about a new earth. It doesn't even need a sea anymore. It's a sea pass away. And then there's this new Jerusalem in verse 2. And, and we read in verse 5, from which I get the, my point title. It says, Behold, I am making all things new. How many of you like new things? <laughs> What's something new you like? What's something new you like? Just kind of throw it out there. A new car, right? You love new cars, right? The smell of a new car. Is real. That's what you're doing. You're doing like this, Nancy, right? What do you got, Brian? A new toothbrush. Fresh toothbrush. What, what do you like new, Michelle? A new pillow. Nice, nice. A new sound system is what Doug is pointing out. Like a new sound system, yes. Anything else you like new? A bear, new Bears quarterback. There you go. We'll see how that turns out. The Packers have got it right. They like the old quarterbacks, what the Packers do. They do well. But new things, right? New shoes or clothes or phones or furniture or cars or houses or carpet or roads. I like new paint on the walls. It smells nice. I like it when knives are new and sharp, when batteries are strong. And that's what heaven will be like. All things will be new. Now, note here that all things are not going to be refurbished in heaven on earth. We get a new heaven and a new earth, right? When it comes to purchasing a phone, a popular option is a refurbished phone. It's how I normally get all of my phones because they're a lot cheaper. I get them older versions and I get them refurbished and they work just fine. That's a phone that's been used before by someone else. Um, screen's been replaced. Maybe a battery has been changed, but it's not new and fresh off the factory. The, the, sometimes there's minor scratches there on the back. Sometimes, depending upon the care of the new user, you can hardly tell it's refurbished, but it is. It's refurbished, but that's not so with the new creation. The new creation will be fresh off the factory lines, unused by anybody, fresh and new. It's like when you go on an airplane and you get your silverware, right? You, you open it up and shh, 
right? Never been touched. It's been clean, fresh and new. And note here also that God isn't going to restore heaven and earth back to some original condition. I mean, some of the most beautiful things we have on earth are restored items. They're antiques, old tables and chairs and dressers that have been restored to the original condition. Those are beautiful, but they're old. That's not the sort of thing that the new creation is like. They're old cars are beautiful. Car shows are beautiful, right? They'll lift the hoods. You can see, look in the engine and say, wow, this has been restored. It's been, been buffed again. It's been painted again. And there's something about these old cars that have been restored. But we know they're old, but they look brand new. If anything in this new creation will not, it will not be restored to look like new, it will be new, fresh off Ford's assembly line, brand new. And I think that all things will remain new in this new creation. You know how it is when things get old? The colors fade, there's scratches and dents, things break, they don't quite work quite like they used to. Um, some older things, there's dirt in the cracks you just can't get out. Uh, just think about the, the carpet beneath the feet in your car. You can vacuum and vacuum and vacuum. You're blue in your face. You're not getting the grime out of your floorboard. In the manufacturing world, also there's something called planned obsolescence, where a product is intentionally designed to be frail so it'll work, but it'll be functional only for a, a limited time. So you've got to buy something else, right? Our plastic goods today are like that. And, and when we think about it, a toaster oven, right? It's cheaper to buy a $70 model than it is to go to try to repair it. Just one hour with a repairman is another $70. And many times it's a cost-benefit that we think. Would you spend a dollar for a plastic food storage container or $3 for a glass one? Or, or do we spend $10 on a plastic lawn chair or $50 on the metal version? It's going to last. And we're always, like, weighing this option. But in the new creation, you don't have to weigh this sort of option. Nobody will ask you at the counter, do you want extended warranty? Because nothing's going to break. Things are different. All, all's new. All, I believe, is going to remain new. You won't have to replace your appliances, your mattresses, your clothes, your shoes. So I want you just to imagine this conversation you have with somebody in heaven in the streets of the New Jerusalem. It says, hi, Fred. Fred, you look really fresh today. And what's Fred say? He says, I feel like new. He says, uh, I slept on my new mattress last night. And, and then you say, you know what, Fred, you look a little different. You, you got a new haircut? Yep. Are you wearing a new shirt? Yep. Are, are those new shoes you got on? And Fred says what? Yep. And then after a little bit of awkward silence, Fred pulls out his phone, you know, like, like we do, and just... He said, oh, Fred, you got a new phone? And he says, what? Yep. He said, here, let me show you a picture. I want to show you a picture of my, my new car and my, my new house on my new property. You know what a dumb question to ask in heaven is? Hey, Fred, what's new? He says, everything is new. This is so unlike the experience that we have on earth. I think there may be some new physics to this, actually. Remember last week we looked at the great white throne judgment. It says in chapter 20 and verse 11 about the earth and the sky, I, I saw a great white throne from him who was seated on it, and from the presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I know last week how, how strange this was, that the, the, the universe is vast. I mean, our solar system could easily fit inside some other sort of solar system, in our galaxy or in any of the hundreds of billions of galaxies, certainly there is place for that. But maybe John was saying there's no place found in them. It's his, his way of describing for us that the new heaven and the new earth function so differently from the first heaven and the first earth that even the universe that we sit in, like, it just doesn't work there even anymore. Because in the new heaven and the new earth, nothing breaks, nothing rusts, nothing decays. Is that how Jesus described the new creation? Matthew 6, verse 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Uh, maybe we need some new physics that keeps everything new. 
It doesn't entropy and doesn't decay and doesn't rust and doesn't oxidize. You know, I majored in physics in college, and it may means that my major in the new heaven and the new earth is totally useless, and I'm totally fine with that. If it keeps everything new, that'd be, that'd be great. Little phrase here, the sea was no more. Right, we're talking about the new heaven, we're talking about the new earth and how everything's going to be new and, and the sea is no more. Just to, it may have a physical reference. Maybe this new heaven and the new earth, the physics is such that we don't need water anymore. Or, or maybe it's a spiritual reference, the chaos of the sea, right, which, which God eliminates right, in the new order. Right? Just the, the sea and the, and the disorder. Right? No, no, things are going to be in order. The new heavens and the new earth. <clears throat> Whatever it means. It means the new heavens and the earth are going to be received by all. Now, John didn't pull this idea of a new heaven and a new earth just out of thin air, right? I mean, he saw it. It was revelation, right? But this is often with revelation, right? It is, it is the book of the Bible that refers to the Old Testament more than any other book of the Bible, yet without ever quoting it. But here, he's, affirming, he's referring to Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, in which Isaiah taught of the, the newness of the, the creation coming in. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold... I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. Things will be so different in the creation, we'll hardly remember this creation, if at all. That's what Isaiah says, the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Like we'll be so enthralled in new creation, we won't. Really be concerned with the old. The pains and sorrows of this creation will all be gone. Instead, there will be the joy of the new Jerusalem. And when we see the new Jerusalem coming in verse 2, and I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And Isaiah is referring to that after talking about the new heavens and the new earth and, and, the, former th- and the new things being so glorious, the former things are hardly remembered. They'll be glad and rejoicing forever in which I create. So Jerusalem would be a joy. And here it is, the new Jerusalem coming down, as it says, uh, verse, out of heaven from God prepares a bride for her husband. Weddings are happy days. Right? Chris uh, shoots weddings. You get to be involved in lots of happy days. A bride adorned for her husband, I think, is almost the epitome of happiness. Much care with the dress, much care with the hair, much care with the makeup, made beautiful for this day of happiness. And such will be the new creation, this holy city, this new Jerusalem, which comes, it'll be, be great joy in that day. And, and we're going to not dwell on this a lot because in verse 9 and following, it speaks about the new Jerusalem, which we'll talk about next week. Well, an extensive look at what that city is like. But suffice to say, a new creation we feel with joy and happiness and this new city, as Isaiah had prophesied long ago. And, and, and not only is a bride long for this day, not only is it joy in the bride, but all creation is longing for this day as well. Romans 8, verse 18 and following, Paul says this, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Here it is. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So the creation, the trees and the fields and the grass and the hills and the mountains are longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And in other words, right, when, it, when it's revealed who the sons of God are, the, the creation will change. And the revealing of the sons of God came at the final judgment. We saw that in chapter 19. We saw where the sheep and the goats are separated. And when the, the goats are judged, the sheep come into God's presence to dwell with him forever. And when that happens, right, the creation is going to rejoice because it's longing for this because it is in sin and enduring the, the trials of sin. And then we see this God dwelling with man in verse 3. He says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This is my second point this morning. Not only will all things be made new, but also our God will be near. 
That's the emphasis here in, in, in verse 3, is that the new creation, in the new creation, God will dwell with men together in perfect harmony. Right? Dwelling close together, a near is a good word for that. Is this not what we celebrate at Christmas every year? We celebrate God coming in flesh and dwelling among us. John 1, 14, and, and the word, which was with God and who was God, the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And what a joy it was that Jesus took the heart of a servant, form of a servant, came to earth, born of a virgin Mary, walked and talked with us. And John says in, in chapter 1, verse 14 of his gospel, we have seen his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and this reality of God dwelling with us is, is so important. We celebrate this every year of our lives. In December, we think much about God coming to dwell with us. As a man, we sing songs about it. Except I think the deans sing songs about this all, all year long. Is that right? <laughs> sort of, half the time. Okay, yeah, Kate, your dad, your parents, not you, right? All right. But we sing about Christmas when it's come to that time. We preach about it. We read about it. We give gifts to each other to remember God's gift. To hear the good news fresh again of Christmas, that God came to dwell with us, to be one of us. To then be a representative sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And that's what made the incarnation of Jesus so special to us. That Jesus didn't just hang out with us for a while and leave. He hung out with us for a while. He became like us. He embraced us. He lived a perfect life. And he saved us when we could, know, we could not save ourselves. Providing salvation for us by dying upon the cross. Free to all who believe. And the freeness of salvation is mentioned here in verse 6, if we just kind of like parallel this down. We, we saw verse 1 and 2 parallel with verse 1, and, and now we see verse 2, the first 3 parallel here with verse 6. And he said to me, it's done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the end of the one to the thirsty. I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Just That requires in order to be with God is you need to have life, and you drink this spring of the water of life. And we get to enjoy this new creation and it's not because we paid for this nice vacation spot. It's because it's been provided for us. Without payment, just belief and faith and trust in Christ. And we can drink this water. It will give us life at no cost to us. It cost everything to Jesus who came to dwell among us with sacrifice for our sins. It was his life for our life. But after he, he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, was with his heavenly father, and we are with him. We are with him and we're drinking this water Living life to the fullest. We see here in verse 3 that we will join him there. Again, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with him and they will be his people. And God himself will be them as their God. And, and this idea of God and man dwelling together someday as, as, as God and, and as his people is one of the great themes of the Bible. Simon Kistemacher in his great commentary said, he called this theme a golden thread woven into the fabric of Scripture from beginning to end. Of God and man dwelling together in harmony. This is the promise to Abraham, Genesis 17, 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. It's the everlasting covenant that I will be your God and you will be my people. It's the promise to Israel, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, Exodus chapter 6 verse 7. You will be my people and I will be your God. It's a promise to obedient Israel, Leviticus 26, 11 and 12. I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. It's the promise of the new covenant, Ezekiel 11, verse 19. I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. And I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I shall be their God. This is where verse 3 really crescendos in all of the, the Bible story, in, in, the, in, the, in the restoration, in the new creation. Yes, all things are new, but what is special is that we as people, redeemed people, get to dwell with God. We get to do so with, with finality. In fact, that's why verse 6 says, it is done. 
Like, like everything is done. And now we're together. We are near. And we can rejoice in such good news. That's why verse 3 says, he said with a loud voice. This is to be rejoiced in. That God is dwelling with us. One thing interesting here, there's a difference here. This isn't quite, this isn't quite Christmas. Because... In Christmas, it was God coming down, taking on human flesh to dwell with us. But now here, it's like us going up to dwell with God forever where he is in the new creation. And I think that's the thrust here is it's permanent. It's going to be with eternity. It's not just a temporary thing that Jesus is with us only to die and leave. It's us then being redeemed and going to be where Jesus is forever. And the relationship here is more than God simply being with us. There's a, a family element as well. And so I'm going to add verse 7 here to the, the parallelism. Verse 7, the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. It's the reality, amazing reality of the gospel that, that not merely are we brought near to God in community, but we are brought near to God as family. Here, here he says, he will be my son, taking from the Reference to the language of 2 Samuel 7 where he promises David and, and David's son to be the one he's going to take as a son. God, this king forever. We're, we're going to be like Jesus. Jesus is the son. But we then become with God in this family as if we are his sons. You know, there's this saying that blood is thicker than water. And that's the idea. God has taken us into his family. And he's going to stick with us through and through. And that blew, God's, blew John's mind in the first epistle. 1 John 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And we are. Like, what kind of love is this that, that we'd be called God's children? But we are God's children. It's often mentioned in the New Testament when Jesus was teaching in the house and his mother and brother were, were seeking him but couldn't get in because of the great crowds. Remember, Jesus looked around. He says, who is my Mother and my brothers, here you are. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus bringing his people in to be with himself in family relationship. Paul in Ephesians 1 verse 4 says that we've received adoption as sons. We've been adopted. We've become into his family. Here we're, we're called sons as we are, are near to God. And as children of God, Paul spoke of how we have an inheritance awaiting for us. In Galatians 8, or Romans 8 and Galatians 4 Romans 8 says this, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs means we receive the inheritance. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Christ is our brother and what Jesus inherits, we inherit because he calls us his son and Jesus is his son and we are near to God in family. And here in Revelation 21 and verse 7, God claims us here as family. I will be his God and he will be my son. That's even more intimate than the, the normal phrase. I will be their God and they shall be my people. But here it is. They shall be my son. The relationship comes through the gospel, through faith in Jesus. But it's all solidified at the second coming of Jesus. John then continues, right? Verse, chapter 3, verse 1, 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the God, Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and such we are. Verse 2, behold, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. That's referring to the second coming, right? When we see him, we're going to be like him. Yes, we're children now, but there's a, there's a way, right? We've been redeemed, but this restoration, we're going to be fully like him. Sinless, with the family of God. When he comes, and he, and he came in Revelation chapter 19, remember that, Jesus coming, riding on this pure and holy white horse, mounted, the white horse, judging and making war. And at his judgment, he reveals who the sons of God are. And God the Father claims us as his child. And then John continues in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, and everyone who has this hope on him purifies himself as he is pure. If you have this hope, of being a child of God someday. I mean, you, you are children of God, but fully understanding and experiencing your, your redemption in the restoration of all things in the new heavens and the new earth, you will, you will purify yourself because you'll long for that day. And so, church family, let's fix our hope on the coming of Jesus that we might live pure lives before him, that we might be near to him with God 
as family. In the new creation, all things will be new. In the new creation, our God will be near. And here it is. In the new creation, all pain will be nulled. Nulled's a bad word, but it starts with N, so we're going to go with it. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Now this hits home for us at Rock Valley Bible Church. We shed tears this past week for Andy Krauss and his family. I'm with you, Adriana, with you, Alyssa, others, Amy back there. Amanda, surely is here. I don't see her here. She's, oh, there you are. You're here. We shed tears with you. Andy's funeral was Friday. His body was laid to the ground. We commend his body to the Lord, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's a very surreal saying those words. We await the promise of the resurrection to come true, and many tears were shed. But Friday wasn't the only day that tears were shed for Andy. I can't count the number of tears that you and the Krauss family shed for the past years, three years since he diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in the past month and even those last 10 days. You, you shed tears before he died and after he died. I will never forget the moment Yvonne and I went to say goodbye to Andy for the last time. We knew this was the last time we'd see him alive. It was surreal to say goodbye to such a friend. And tears were shed then too. And the promise here is that there'll be no more tears. We have tears here on earth, right? I mean, my mother's in hospice care right now. A few weeks ago, we thought she was going to pass away before Andy. But now she's stable. She tired, sleeps all day, communicates very little. My, my dad, with a, a Hoyer lift, I think it is, has to lift her up with this, whatever, big contraption, put her in a wheelchair, tries to get her up, tries to eat for breakfast and dinner. And she's up for 15 minutes for breakfast or dinner. It's amazing. It's a long time. She eats maybe a little bit, drinks a little bit. It's only just a matter of time before she passes away. She might be tomorrow. It might be a few months. We don't know. I shed tears for my mother. Many of you have gone through this. I know, Ray Hook, you're going through this right now. Your dad is, is doing very poorly. And he's kind of lost all his will to live. And, you'll shed tears. and you've lost loved ones. You've lost parents and maybe siblings. The tears over the death of, of loved ones are the reality of this life, of this life, but not the new creation life. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Love the tender care that God shows here. He himself taking out the Kleenex and he himself dabbing it under the tear duct, taking the tears away from our eyes as he himself wipes them away. That's what he does here, kind of cleaning up. It's a new creation, right? When, when, when things are clean, right? He's, he, when the new creation comes, the new heaven, the new earth comes, it's also coming with some Kleenex to be used and then thrown away and be done with. That's not if God hasn't been aware of our tears before. In Psalm 56, verse 8, David speaks about his tears are captured in a bottle. His way of just saying that God knows my tears. And, and, and you never shed a tear that God doesn't see. But he lets them flow, gathers them in a bottle, and knows all about them. But there will be a day when the tears will be gone, and, and tears will be gone because death is no longer present anymore. And that's the right comes right after that. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. And this is John, once again, a Brian read from Isaiah 25. Here it is. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Destroying death, wiping tears, those things come together. With apocalyptic imagery here, John describes the death of death as it's hurled into the lake of fire. And, and, and if I said earlier, if we saw earlier, the new creation may require some new physics. Uh, new creation also may require some new biology as well. Because all life on earth dies. Plants and pets and bugs and birds and trees and termites, they all die. But not so the new creation. See, when, when God takes away the old things, brings in the new, it's going to be different, and death is going to be done. There will be death no more. And again, it's not that heaven and earth are refurbished or, or renewed, right? In the first creation, if you just renewed, death is possible. 
you, you, you paint a room and it gets dirty, it gets scuffed up again, right? You, you have a carpet and carpet spills on the carpet, right? But not so the new creation. With the, the new creation, death isn't possible. In the first creation, death was possible. When God made the promise to Adam, he said, you can eat from any tree, but don't eat from that tree because in the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Indeed, the old creation, the creation we have, death was possible for Adam and Eve. And it turned out to be the reality. But in the new creation, there's no such tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil from which we can eat and die is not there. The temptation is gone. We are far better off. It's not that we will not die. It's that we cannot die. We'll have eternal life, as Jesus promised, for everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is what it means to have eternal life, not to die. But further than death, there's, there's no pain. If you look at verse 4, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So just think about all the, the former painful things that have passed away. Here they're described, but a few, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. I'm thinking about the pain of this life. No more sickness. No more strife. No more sorrows. No more fear. No more guilt. No more resentment. No more regret. No more pain or pride. No more hunger or hatred. No more trials or temptation. No more crime or covetousness, no more death or decay. All will be well on that day because sin and all of its fruits will be banished from creation. In fact, that's what verse 8 says if we add verse 8 to our, uh, our outline here. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. See, God's going to banish sin and sinners from the new creation. Only the pure will enter the new creation. And now would be a good time to really take inventory in your life, especially as we transition to the Lord's Supper. Paul commands us in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, to examine ourselves before we eat and drink the cup. These are the sorts of people who will be kept out of this new creation. And so I just ask you, right, one by one, are you cowardly? What an amazing thing to be at the top of the list. Are you cowardly? Proverbs 20-something says, the righteous are bold as a lion. Because you're right, you can stand before the Lord. You're bold with what you believe. You can speak on what you believe rather than cowering in fear. Those who cower in fear, ashamed of Jesus, Jesus will be ashamed of them. They will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But here, the cowardly will not get there. The faithless. I mean, that's, the, that's how you get into heaven. I right? said, so how you get into new creation is by believing and by, by trusting. But there are those who are faithless. Who don't believe, don't trust. I'm going to do it on my own. I'm okay. I don't need your help. I'm an American. I'm self-sufficient. I can do it all. Are you detestable? That is so warped by your sin. There's just a putrid there. Are you a murderer? What about your anger towards people? Jesus extended that to. Are you sexually immoral? In our day and age, with free pornography all around, does that apply to you? Perhaps you need to repent. Are you a sorcerer? That's involved in witchcraft. I, I trust that's not you. But could be involved in delving into like spiritual matters which the Bible speaks nothing of, speaks against. Are you an idolater? Are the things you hold up higher than God? Are you a liar? Or do you speak the truth in love? Do you see these sins in yourself? Right? I mean... All you got to do is push down a little bit. Are you a liar? Have you ever told a lie? Of course we have, right? Are you idolatry? Have you ever said anything above God? Of course we have. Right? There's degrees here, which when you say, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of that. Where you are, though, just encourage you to, to cry out to the Lord, confess your sin, repent, and turn to the Lord and long for this day. Because this day is going to happen. 
it is firm and secure. It will be for sure. Like there's one phrase I missed. I'm not sure if you saw it. I missed in verse 5. I was waiting for this time. He said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And, and what I've told you, what basically what, uh, what John was told is that these words will happen. You may have other people saying, oh, this is going to happen. You're not going to give a new creation. This, this world is all it is, right? You die, you go into the ground, you get eaten by worms. This is all it is. And the authority of the word of God says, no, these words are faithful and true. They will, they will come to pass. Just think about 2 Peter when Peter is talking about this, that he says, scoffers will come in the last days where they're scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And they'll say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. They've died. Things are still the same from back then and today. This was 2,000 years ago. Scoffers were talking about this. They talk about it today. Everything's the same. They deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water and by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Oh, all have not been the same. The world perished once in water. And by the same, Peter continues on, by the same word in 2 Peter 3, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. This will happen. There will be a new heavens and a new earth someday. I'm not setting a date. I'm not telling you when. I don't know when. But this will come. As sure, as sure is sure. And I just encourage you to embrace them and trust them and realize that these sorts of people will not get to enjoy the new creation. So turn from those things. And I just think about 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when Paul says about uh, the different various sorts of people who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He says there, if I turn there really fast, I got it right here. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, right? Much the same list right here. Sexually immoral idolaters are right here. Nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, it's not that, that nobody who ever did those things is ever going to inherit the kingdom of God because Paul says such were some of you. But you're washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And so former cowardly people will get in the kingdom of heaven. Formerly faithless people will be in this new creation. Formerly detestable and formerly murderers and sexually immoral. Formerly sorcerers and idolaters and liars will enter. Have you been washed in the blood of Christ? Because those are the ones who get to enjoy this new creation where there's no more tears, no more sorrow. On the other side, however, there are tears and sorrows. But those are the ones in the lake of fire. But for those of us who trust in Christ, we enjoy the new creation. And, and the Lord's Supper is merely a, an identification to say, I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm trusting in the Lord's Supper. I'm not trusting in myself. And I'm eating it and drinking it in obedience to him. As he, he says, this is my body. Yes, Lord, I, I'm taking that body. I'm, I'm, this is what I'm believing. This is the blood of the new covenant. Yes, I'm drinking that covenant because that's the blood I'm trusting in. The blood of the new covenant. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for these wonderful, hope-filled, giving words that can get us past this life. God, that are, are beyond this life. And, and though we have death and sorrow and pain and anguish and tears today, there'll be a day where that won't be our experience evermore. We won't go to a funeral in the new creation, oh God. And we do look, God, forward to that day. And I pray even as we eat the bread and drink the cup now, oh God, I pray that you'd be with us. Help us, strengthen us. Open our eyes that we would cast all of our, our cares on you and anxieties upon you. And, and pledge, oh God, for... For your strength to say we believe, help our unbelief. God, we are, are sinners and yet justified, and we need your grace and mercy in our lives. Oh God, so feed us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.